This is totally mind-blowing. SpaceX and NASA have just shown off a new SpaceX Starship Cargo Lunar Lander design, featuring many cutting-edge improvements compared to the previous variant we knew. This promises to help the United States establish a sustainable presence on the Moon within the next few years. So what makes this variant special compared to what we have known? What groundbreaking upgrades have been integrated, and how will they help NASA and SpaceX succeed in their future missions? Let's find out in today's episode. Comparison Starship Crewed HLS versus Starship Cargo Landers In 2021, SpaceX secured a massive $2.9 billion contract from NASA to land the first crew on the moon since the Apollo program and to develop cargo variants of the lander. Initially, NASA and SpaceX were primarily focused on the crew aspect of the HLS award. However, as SpaceX ramped up the development pace of Starship, NASA reported in April 2024 that work was underway on the cargo variant of the lander. NASA hopes that this variant will be ready for the Artemis 7 mission, which is slated for September 2031. Actually, before the fourth test flight of the Starship rocket, SpaceX had already begun work on developing this variant. However, information about the Starship variants serving the Artemis missions is pretty scarce. Until recently, NASA unveiled graphical images of the Starship cargo landers, giving us a glimpse into the future of lunar exploration. This cargo variant of the Starship lander is a modified version of the human landing system, currently being developed for Artemis III. It mirrors the Starship HLS in many ways. The shape of the cargo landers remains conical and tall, embodying the cutting-edge design that SpaceX is well known for. Moreover, the cargo landers are painted white, just like the Starship HLS. White paint reflects sunlight far more effectively than darker colors, helping to keep the surface temperature of the spacecraft lower when it's exposed to intense solar radiation. This reflective quality is essential in space, where there's almost no atmosphere to provide protection against the relentless bombardment of solar radiation and cosmic rays. By reflecting sunlight, the white paint plays a crucial role in maintaining a stable internal temperature. This, in turn, minimizes the negative impact on the spacecraft's sensitive onboard electronics and systems, ensuring they operate efficiently and reliably. One notable aspect of this variant is that it lacks a heat shield since it is designed for a one-way trip and will not be reused. The spacecraft will not return to Earth but will remain on the Moon indefinitely. Because it doesn't need to re-enter the atmosphere, it also lacks flight control surfaces, which will reduce its mass and the number of Starship refueling launches needed. Specifically, this variant does not feature the flaps found on standard versions. Both versions are equipped with six Raptor engines, including three Raptor vacuum engines, and three sea-level engines used during launch, flight, and most of the landing process. The gravity on the moon is only about one-sixth of that on Earth, making it problematic to use powerful engines like the Raptor for landing. Even at its lowest power setting, the Raptor can generate too much thrust, potentially pushing the lander back up instead of allowing for a safe descent. Additionally, the lunar surface is covered with a fine layer of regolith dust. When a powerful engine like the Raptor operates near the surface, it creates a strong plume of gas that can stir up a large amount of lunar dust, spreading it everywhere. This severely limits visibility, making it difficult to control and accurately position the lander during descent. The extremely abrasive nature of lunar dust can also damage the lander's surfaces and sensitive equipment, as well as structures around the landing site. For these reasons, as the ship approaches the lunar surface within about 100 meters, these variants will utilize high-thrust RCS thrusters located mid-body to ensure a safe and gentle landing. However, since the two variants have different purposes, their designs are optimized accordingly. The first difference between between those variants is the payload bay door. The Starship HLS boasts a horizontally opening structure, a sleek, straightforward mechanism that's both easy to operate and maintain. In contrast, the cargo landers adopt a clamshell design. These doors can open very wide, creating an expansive space perfect for deploying even the largest or most complex payloads with ease. Now let's talk about the lift system. The Starship cargo ditches the intricate lift system with a safety basket, which is meant for the crew. Instead, it features a robust, large-scale lift system operating on a simple pulley mechanism designed with load bearing in mind. This pragmatic approach ensures that even the heaviest payloads can be handled efficiently. Standing at an impressive 50 meters tall, the Starship needs to ensure stability upon landing on the moon. Both the crewed and cargo variants come equipped with landing legs to prevent toppling. However, for the crewed variant, the landing legs simply seem to be retracted and flush against the lander's body during launch. The cargo landers, conversely, have landing legs stowed within the body, only deploying them during the landing sequence. Noticeably absent in the cargo landers are solar arrays and windows. This stark difference underscores the uncrewed nature of the cargo variant. There's no need for life support system, and automation takes the front seat. 
According to the release note from NASA, the cargo variant of SpaceX's Starship is expected to land approximately 26,000 to 33,000 pounds of payload on the lunar surface. This raises significant questions, especially considering that the current Starship V-1, as stated by SpaceX, can carry up to 100 tons of payload into space. Why then does this variant only carry a maximum of 15 tons to the moon? Is this due to NASA's requirement, or are there other reasons at play? Do you have any ideas? Share them in the comment section. Well, while SpaceX has not publicly discussed the specifics of their work on the cargo versions of their HLS landers, Elon Musk did highlight the capability of the Starship vehicle to land large payloads on the moon in a presentation posted by SpaceX on January 12th. We want to far exceed what NASA's asked us to do, he said. We want to go far beyond the NASA requirements and actually be able to put enough payload on the moon with enough frequency that you could actually have a permanently occupied moon bay. Therefore, it is plausible that the 12 to 15 ton payload capacity is merely the minimum requirement set by NASA for the cargo variant of the lander. Renderings from SpaceX show that the Starship will carry three rovers to the moon. These are pressurized rovers designed by the Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency, JAXA. They support a crew of two for up to a month and operate for an impressive decade. Their capabilities extend beyond just carrying astronauts. They can be remotely controlled from Earth, performing crucial autonomous tasks between missions, making them an invaluable asset for lunar exploration. This represents a significant significant international collaboration in space exploration. In early April of this year, NASA and JAXA signed an agreement that NASA would use either the Starship or Blue Origin's cargo lander to deliver the vehicles to the moon. Although Starship cargo landers boast excellent capabilities and can meet all of NASA's demanding requirements, it's clear that relying on a single solution is not viable, which is why we also have Blue Moon, Blue Origin's cargo lander. When comparing Starship landers to Blue Moon, we see that Starship landers are significantly larger. Blue Moon appears to be capable of carrying only one rover with a relatively traditional elevator system. This preliminary design suggests that its payload capacity is somewhat limited, perhaps only one-third of the capacity of the Starship variant. Given the growing interest in lunar exploration, it would be advantageous for Blue Origin to develop a larger cargo lunar lander. In the past, Blue Origin has shown remarkable tenacity, tirelessly challenging NASA's decision to award the 2.9 billion dollar Starship HLS contract to SpaceX. It wasn't merely about pouring in a lot of money. Jeff Bezos and his team staked their credibility in these legal battles. Although the U.S. Government Accountability Office rejected the protests and found that NASA did not violate procurement law in awarding the contract to SpaceX, who bid a much lower cost and more capable human and cargo lunar landing capability for NASA Artemis. Ultimately, their persistence paid off in May 2023 when they secured an astonishing $3.4 billion contract to develop the Blue Moon. This is a colossal investment, and I genuinely hope they can leverage every penny of it to its fullest potential and prove their ambition and capability. However, all things considered, at this stage, we're still looking at rendering. NASA will meticulously evaluate the progress made by its contractors and subsequently decide whether these vehicles are ready to lock in their specifications and proceed with the detailed design phase. As per the current timelines, these spacecraft are not expected to launch before September 2031. Consequently, there may still be modifications to to their design and appearance as development continues. Well, the year 2031 has been set as a critical milestone for lunar landing missions, but the reality is that the program's progress heavily depends on the outcomes of the preceding Artemis missions. So far, we have only witnessed the success of Artemis I, a significant step, but merely the beginning of a long journey. Artemis II, the mission planned to fly astronauts around the moon, is currently delayed until September 2025. The primary reason for this delay is that NASA needs more time to thoroughly study and address issues related to the heat shield of the Orion spacecraft following its first flight. This cautious and necessary step ensures maximum safety for future crewed missions. Inevitably, this means that Artemis III, the mission aimed at landing astronauts on the lunar surface, may also face delays. This implies that the historic moment when Americans once again set foot on the moon could be postponed by a few years from the original plan. However, such delays are not unusual in the realm of space exploration, where safety and precision are always the top priorities. Despite these delays, the program's work can continues to progress on multiple fronts. The Gateway Space Station, a critical component in the long-term plan to establish a sustainable presence on the Moon, is in its final stages of construction. This station will serve as a bridge between Earth and the Moon, supporting future research and exploration activities. Simultaneously, SpaceX, a key partner in NASA's Artemis program, is making significant strides in developing and testing the Starship at its facility in Boca Chica, Texas.
During the third integrated flight test, SpaceX successfully conducted a fuel transfer test between two tanks. This not only marks an impressive technical achievement, but also lays a crucial foundation for future Artemis missions. Never been more excited about the next decade to come. Even if we don't colonize Mars in the short term, a lunar base would be an incredible milestone. Who knows? Maybe some of us will even visit Earth's only natural satellite someday. Initially, Musk wasn't particularly interested in the silver planet. The Starship spacecraft was primarily designed with Mars as its ultimate goal. However, over time, Musk recognized the strategic value of establishing a base on the moon before venturing deeper into the solar system. This is a smart and sensible idea. The moon could serve as a way station between Earth and Mars, allowing scientists and engineers to test technologies, hone skills, and gather invaluable experience in an extraterrestrial environment. This would better prepare SpaceX and other space agencies for the enormous challenges of conquering Mars. Additionally, a lunar base could become a significant revenue stream, attracting investments from government governments, private companies, and even the burgeoning space tourism industry. The ambition to establish a long-term human presence on the moon isn't new. Yet, despite decades of dreaming, it has remained just that, a dream. The primary barriers have been technological limitations and the enormous costs associated with space missions. NASA and traditional launch providers have historically faced two major hurdles, limited transport capabilities and sky-high launch costs. In the past, sending just one kilogram of payload to low Earth orbit, LEO, could cost tens of thousands of dollars. A single launch could easily rack up hundreds of millions of dollars, making it economically unfeasible to transport the vast quantities of materials and equipment needed for a lunar base. These weight constraints deeply influenced every aspect of mission design and space systems. Everything from schedules, cost structures, volume, material choices, to issues of labor, energy, thermal control, guidance, navigation, and control had to be optimized to minimize weight. The result? Spacecraft built before the advent of Starship were often likened to steel bullets, incredibly complex, prohibitively expensive, and severely limited in payload capacity. This situation created a vicious cycle. Building a lunar base requires vast amounts of materials and equipment, but each flight could only carry a limited payload. This necessitated a large number of launches, driving overall costs to an unacceptable level and stretching project timelines to the breaking point. Even a single lunar exploration mission was prohibitively expensive, let alone constructing a permanent base. The colossal costs made the ambition of a lunar base seem financially impossible and industrially unfeasible. One of the biggest obstacles to building a lunar base was the payload limitations of launch vehicles. Getting heavy, large-scale construction equipment and infrastructure to the moon simply wasn't feasible with the rockets we had, that is, until Starship came along. Starship is designed to carry up to 100 tons of payload to low Earth orbit. With a diameter of 9 meters and a height of over 50 meters, it can transport large construction equipment and modules intact, reducing the need for complex assembly on the lunar surface. Its fully reusable design promises to slash launch costs, potentially bringing them down to just a few hundred dollars per kilogram. At the Lunar Surface Innovation Consortium's spring meeting, SpaceX unveiled its bold plan to establish a lunar base. According to the ambitious blueprint, setting up a solid foothold on the moon will require three basic types of starship landings. First, the utility starship. This will be the heart of the base, acting as the operational hub. It will provide power, ensure communication, store data, and house essential resources. Establishing a robust infrastructure from the outset is crucial for the long-term success of the base. Second, the Rolling Stock Starships. These will carry the mobile equipment and construction machinery needed for base expansion. This includes rovers for lunar surface exploration, construction equipment to grow the base. The ability to leverage local resources is key to sustaining a long-term presence on the moon minimizing reliance on Earth's supplies. Finally, the Habitation Starships. These will serve as living quarters for astronauts, specifically designed to ensure comfort and safety in the Moon's harsh environment. These modules will provide living, working, and research spaces for scientists and engineers. SpaceX has demonstrated that they have the capability to meet all the requirements for a sustained human presence on the Moon. Logistically, Starship's large payload capacity and low launch costs will solve the transportation challenges. The HLS, Human Landing System, variant of Starship, selected by NASA for the Artemis program can safely deliver astronauts to the lunar surface. On the communication front, SpaceX's Starlink satellite network could be extended to provide high-speed, reliable internet connectivity between Earth and the Moon. Here's an interesting detail. SpaceX's plan for this lunar mission 
known as the Lunar Architecture Capability Study for 10 years, Luna 10, is actually supported by the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, DARPA. Fascinating, right? Now, what do you think? How might the military get involved in building a moon base, and for what purpose? Drop your thoughts in the comments below. SpaceX has strategically chosen to build its lunar base near the moon's south pole, a decision driven by several critical factors. This region receives a substantial amount of sunlight, which is vital for generating power through solar panels. A stable energy supply will ensure the continuous operation of the base and its research equipment. Additionally, the area is believed to hold significant reserves of water ice within permanently shadowed regions. Water is not only essential for life but can also be split into hydrogen and oxygen. This invaluable in-situ resource could drastically reduce the cost and complexity of future missions. Moreover, the South Pole region holds many mysteries about the Moon's geological history and could provide precious insights into the formation of the solar system. However, before SpaceX can realize its ambitious conquest of the Moon, the company must overcome a critical technical challenge, orbital refueling. This is a key step not just for lunar missions but for the future of deep space exploration. Here's the deal. Starship has a pretty hefty dry mass. This means that while Starship can carry a significant amount of fuel, its large dry mass limits its range when launched directly from Earth. Starship requires much more fuel than can be carried in a single launch. So, we need refueling. And that's no small feat. SpaceX's solution? Develop a three-variant Starship system specifically for this mission. First up, we have the Tanker Starship. These are designed to carry fuel into low Earth orbit, LEO, to be used later by the HLS Starship. They're based on the same standard Starship design we're all familiar with. Next, we've got the Depot Starship, essentially a fuel storage unit in LEO. This variant is modeled after the Starship lander design, but without the landing system. It's built to store fuel until it's needed for lunar missions. And finally, there's the HLS Starship, the vehicle that will actually land on the moon's surface. It's equipped with a specialized landing system tailored for lunar conditions. Among these three variants, the tanker Starship will be the only one to return to Earth and be reused, so it's equipped with all the components we typically see on the standard Starship. The depot, serving solely as a storage unit, strips away everything non-essential, fins, heat shields, and more simplifying its structure. The HLS Starship, designed exclusively to transport humans to the moon, sports a sleek, purpose-built design. Since it's not intended to return to Earth, it doesn't need a heat shield. Instead, it'll be painted white and adorned with a national flag on top. NASA, in a presentation early last June, revealed that the HLS Starship will feature a crew compartment, solar arrays, a garage, and a lift. SpaceX's lunar landing strategy is a meticulous sequence of steps, starting with the critical refueling process. First up, they launch a propellant depot into low Earth orbit. Following this, multiple tanker starships will rendezvous, dock with this depot, and transfer fuel. Once refueled, the tankers head back to Earth, ready for their next mission. This space-based fuel transfer is a monumental challenge, something that's never been attempted before. Currently, it's estimated that SpaceX needs around 16 launches just to refuel for the upcoming Artemis 3 mission. Wow, that's a lot. And if we're talking about building a moon base, that number is going to skyrocket. But no worries. Once Starship 3, with its massive 200-ton payload capacity, comes online, the number of required flights could be significantly reduced. And guess what? We're going to witness this docking and fuel transfer many, many times before Starship is ready for its moon landing. SpaceX has to perfect this incredibly tricky maneuver, moving fuel between two spaceships through repeated practice until they get it absolutely right. They're pushing to test space-based refueling as soon as possible, possibly starting from Flight 7. That's going to be one hell of a sight to see. All right, that's it for today. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel for more in-depth looks at the latest advancements in space technology. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.